Welcome to episode three of our series, Initial Margin for Uncleared Derivatives in 2019 and 2020. The Custodian's Guide to Initial Margin Segregation and Asset Transformation. In episode one, we looked at the global rules for IAM, their progressive implementation and scope, how IAM is held, the documentation architecture supporting legal opinions and technology solutions. In episode two, Jonathan Martin, CEO of the alternative legal services provider DRS and I, focused on successfully navigating, negotiating and executing the legal documentation in an IM project. Today, I'm joined by Mark Higgins, Senior Product Lead of BNY Mellon. BNY Mellon is one of the leading custodians in initial margin. If you're a phase four or phase five institution and you appoint BNY Mellon as your custodian, you'll be involved with Mark and his team. And if you don't appoint BNY Mellon as your custodian, you're still likely to come into contact with Mark and his team, as in all likelihood, one or more of your counterparties will have appointed BNY Mellon as their custodian. In episode three, we consider the margin segregation options available for phase four and phase five counterparties. How to source the right collateral to meet IM regulatory obligations. The differences between tri-party and third-party collateral management and what may be right for you, as well as collateral transformation, that's how you convert assets when needed to meet market obligations. So before launching into those topics, let's put the role of the custodian in IM in perspective with this excerpt from episode one. Up on the diagram here is an illustration of how IM is held. This diagram will apply for each pairing between counterparty groups. We have two counterparties. Looking here at the top part of the diagram, party A posts its IM amount to a secured account with its custodian. Party A is called the pledgeor or chargeor. A security interest or pledge over the IM and account with the custodian is granted to party B. Party B is the secured party. Looking at the bottom part of the diagram, party B is also required to post IM to its custodian. It may be the same custodian or it may not be. For example, party A's custodian could be the Bank of New York Mellon and party B's custodian could be Euroclear. The two sets of posted IM cannot be netted against each other. They must be segregated. Party B will also post its initial margin to an account held with its custodian. Under this arrangement, Party B will be the pledgeor and Party A the secured party. Mark, um, welcome to the series. We've spoken together on IM topics in London, Copenhagen, Milan, Frankfurt, we're soon to choose to go out to Hong Kong. And um, one of my favourite uh, client education materials for initial margin that I've come across is the BNY Mellon Meeting Your Non-Cleared Margin Obligations board game. Um, what are the uh, key features uh, that you show there? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, firstly, it's a relatively complicated subject, initial margin. So putting it down onto uh, what we have here as a board um, was designed to be easy and simplified to digest. And the various steps that you have to take um, are in some way process driven. They're in a particular order. And one of the key steps that you must undertake at the beginning, we point out here, is the custodial selection. So during your project, it's important that you've mapped out all of the steps that you need to undertake. But number one on that really comes up as custodial selection. Certainly when we've uh, been involved in market surveys, um, what the market says to us is their biggest concern across phase four and phase five is custodian onboarding. Are you seeing client engagement um, already for phase five? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say the education around phase five started uh, towards the end of last year. Uh, you give rise there to where we've worked before. I think that uh, when we were in those other cities, most of the audience were phase five. 
I think phase four is uh, somewhat sold, it's done now, mm -hmm. and will be delivered later this year. But for phase five, those that are in scope are correctly paying the right attention from, from towards the end of last year up till this point today. And for the market, there's probably four or five principal custodians that um, the market or phase four and phase five counterparties will consider appointing. Mm. But um, there's also other new, new, new custodians coming in. Do you, do you see this being quite a crowded field next year or do you think it's, all go it's mainly going to gravitate towards the existing main players? Well, I think uh, certainly for the earlier book of business, most of those firms have adopted the four tri-party agents. Um, so when the market is receiving collateral, the new entrants are receiving, mm -hmm. it's very likely that they'll be receiving off of one of the four main tri-party agents. Where I think you're uh, suggesting here is that as and when the phase particularly the phase fives enter the arena, they'll bring with them potentially a hundred mm -hmm. different custodians. And you could see every custodian, big and small, potentially entering the arena to, to supply segregated margin. Personally, I actually don't think that will happen. Mm -hmm. I actually think it will be a smaller set. In the way that in the earlier phases we had four tri-party agents, my personal belief is I think we will have X number, but a smaller number of the main custodians that will step forward. We're going to talk a little bit later about tri-party and third-party. Um, who are those agents? Uh, in tri-party, it's ourselves, BMY Mellon. Uh, we operate on a global footprint, so in the US, in APAC, and, and in Europe. Plus, you'll have JP Morgan, so the two of us are in the bank model, classic mm -hmm. bank model. And then you have the two main ICSDs, so Clearstream and Euroclear. And looking back to the board game here, um, talk me through some of the other key um, steps on the... Uh, on the I hesitate to call it a game, but uh, the, yeah. the, the process. I think uh, one of the ones you see here on box four is the calculation of the margin. And maybe you would agree, but where we've been out talking to the market, th this is a particular area of concern. Mm -hmm. So whilst they may well be able to deal with the legal process, the operational process, I think that many in phase five are somewhat struggling or confused by the requirement to calculate initial margin, albeit it's been given to a standard market uh, term called SIM, but it, it's a new thing for many to get to grips with. So calculating the margin is a big, is a big issue, number four on the box. Well, I interesting, you know, this is episode three in the series. Um, episode four, we have um, Hiroshi Tanasi of IHS Market, whom you know well, who's going to take mm. us through how you actually calculate that initial margin. But that um, business of calculating that, how does that fit in with you as a custodian? How, do, how does that um, calculation relate to what you're doing day to day in the process. So we are, we are downstream yep. from this process. And the way you have to th think about this is that uh, we'll trade, yep. two parties will trade, they'll book their transactions, it will go down to the likes of uh, markets uh, calculation service or another, and it will result in an outcome. Mm -hmm. And the outcome is really what the, the tri-party agent or the custodian is looking for. Two parties will have agreed their margin, let's say they both agree it's 10, Yep. At this point, they'll supply that number of plus 10, minus 10 to the tri-party agent who will be able to allocate the appropriate collateral on the day. Uh, as we will probably explain later, there is another option being the third-party custodial model, mm -hmm. which does result in some differences. But in both cases, they require initially an agreement on the initial margin number. And are there any other points that stand out from...? I've heard it said that the dispute ratio for IM is actually pretty high. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the parties from one through three are readily calculating and exchanging initial margin numbers, but the, the frequency of dispute is, is pretty mm. high. So it's become very much in, uh, a requirement or an expectation that not only will you exchange numbers, but equally a reconciliation will be performed to ensure that both parties are within agreed tolerances. Let's take a look at a sample of the derivative products which are in scope for initial margin, i.e. the OTC derivative transactions between counterparties which a counterparty must provide initial margin to its counterparty for. These can be uh, generic products such as total return swaps, uh, volatility variance swaps. In the equities world it can be equity option swaps and forwards uh, for credit deri derivatives, there'll be single name CDS, um, some of the index uh, CDS types, and contingent CDS. Um, something that uh, has been a big market issue is FX. 
So FX uh, forward swaps uh, options and non-deliverable forwards are counted uh, towards um, the, the ANA, the aggregate average notional amount, uh, which uh, determines which phase a phase uh, a counterparty will fall, fall into. The other uh, two product types which are in scope are interest rate swaps, so those could be basis swaps, forward rate agreements, inflation swaps and swaptions, and commodities, so commodity swaps, options and forwards, and other more bespoke instruments such as freight derivatives. Under the EMEA and Dodd-Frank rules, as well as uh, many of the other major rule sets, the following assets may be eligible collateral. Cash, which is subject to some significant restrictions. Gold, which is generally impractical. Debt securities, um, i.e. government and corporate bonds. And main index securities, i.e. tradable shares on indices such as the S&P 500 and FTSE uh, 100. Uh, now, that's broadly speaking. There are nuances between the different regimes of exactly what may be posted. And, and this is something that we look at in a little bit more detail in episode five, which I uh, do with Chet and Joshi of, of Margin Reform, where we look at the compliance process. But Mark, having outlined what a counterparty has to margin against and what is it, it is allowed to use to satisfy that margin, what options does a phase four uh, or phase five counterparty have? Okay, so uh, maybe looking at, at what these are, if we discount gold in practical, no one's using it, no one really knows what to do with it. But if we look at cash, so in certain jurisdictions around the world, cash is fully eligible, 100% potentially could be given in cash. But that's few and far between. Uh, cash has severe restrictions under the US market. Cash has some allowance within the, within the uh, rule book here in, in, in EMEA as well. Um, but really that's a conversation between two counterparties. Mm -hmm. um, one of the key reasons why cash was seen as restricted is that you're taking a custodial risk by leaving cash on a custodian's balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Now some might be comfortable with that, some uncomfortable, and even if the regulation permits, it's a very clearly a bilateral conversation that you'll need to have with your counterparties that everyone needs to be comfortable. Um, there is a slight extension, not written on the slide, but cash alternatives are being looked at now, money market funds yeah. as a viable option. And I think that adds uh, a lot of firepower to the US market, where again, cash is mm. largely not possible. For clients that would normally post cash, if it becomes possible to post cash through to a money fund, mm. which could well be investing in US treasuries, very yeah, simplistic yeah. looking fund, and then you allocate that, mm. then the fund becomes a security. The debt security section, the third well, Actually, I'll stop you there, because there has been some, I mean, this, the money market funds does bring up one of those nuances we mentioned, that in EMEA, uh, you can post money market funds, yeah. as with the other major jurisdictions, but uh, the EMEA rules say these should be USITS funds. Now, of course, USITS are an EU regulatory creation, and yeah. we're limited to those. And in other jurisdictions, we'll have limits to quite different types of money market funds. So I think that's a good example that we can look at these broad classes of eligible collateral, mm -hmm. but there will be regional nuances. And for you as a, a global custodian, that means it's going to be different things can sometimes be posted in different markets and right. you have to be set up to That's do right. that. That's right. And I think you know, one of the things as a global custodian is it's for us to be educated and aware of how all the rules work and how things can fit together. But at the end of the day, we do what we're told. Mm -hmm. As long as we're, we're in compliance with our own regulatory uh, mm -hmm. obligations, and we technically can support it is something that has to be very clear. It's for the clients to define whether a use it is eligible in the US rules or mm -hmm. European rules or whether cash is eligible within their collateral sets. And I think, you know, technically supported, I mean, that's where you, you spoke about gold. If, if a client comes to you and says, we'd really love to post gold, you're going to say, well, yep. we don't have any. Yeah, we don't <laughs> have bolts. the means. We'd have a bolt. Exactly. I mean, we've looked at it in the yeah. past, but yeah. the reality is it doesn't work. But if we, if we come back onto the main other items mm. um, and we look at how this has been done over the previous phases you go back to phase one the big banks entered the arena and most of them started posting main govies mm. US treasuries why because it was a relatively simple asset class it was a good asset class that you'd have comf confidence would settle 
Now we're three years down the line, we're seeing an expansion into corporates, an expansion mm -hmm. into equities, cheaper forms of collateral, you yeah. might call yeah. it. Um, but I think as we see new entrants, the new entrants are probably following the same as the same path as the larger firms, which is don't, uh, don't run before you can walk. So mm -hmm. many firms will enter in in phase four and five and probably have relatively simple collateral sets, probably giving Euro government mm -hmm. debt or US, mm -hmm. treas uh, US treasuries. And then I think with time and confidence, I would expect them to expand their collateral set to give wider forms of assets in the same way that the P123s have learned to do. And I think when you look at who are those phase four and phase five, particularly the phase fives, and you look at EMEA and it has this broad definition of financial institution. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the banks, but it's the asset managers, mm -hmm. it's the hedge funds and, and the pension funds and the insurance companies. And as you say, you're growing confidence, a pension fund three, four years down the line, of course they're going to have a lot of government treasuries and government yeah. debt, but they'll have plenty of other things which uh, with sophisticated managers they may, may be starting to look to post. Yeah, and, and I think it's, it's valid to say that uh, a buy side firm, if we, if we use that broad brush term, may have the same desire to optimise their assets in the same way that a large sell side firm has done. Very different dynamic, but actually why, why should they just be giving the US Treasury? If they have a broad asset class in their portfolio, and they, again they have the right technical ability, then they have the same as a bank. Mm -hmm. They can allocate various assets because the rules can be written that way, particularly if they operate on a tri-party platform. So what you're saying, it will we'll start simple and then probably become more com complex over I the think years. That's highly likely. Mark, in episode two we discussed a hypothetical counterparty, the Cadiz Group. Let's imagine a hypothetical counterparty group. Let's call it the Cadiz Group. The Cadiz Group has 50 billion euros of gross notional amount outstanding derivatives at the measurement point, placing it in phase five. It has 10 in-scope entities, including a pension fund and asset management in Denmark, and banking entities in Spain, Italy, France, Switzerland, and Singapore. Those 10 entities have 80 ISDA master agreements in place, with a mixture of entities in phase one, two, three, four, and five, counterparty groups. Those 80 ISDA master agreements are spread over 24 counterparty groups. If you had Cadiz Group as a client, um, what would you advise, it, uh, advise to it in relation to its options? Okay, so firstly, um, I won't advise, but I will respond to consider what they require to meet their needs. I mean, that's, that's how I have to position things. And as we've said, I have two main methods of segregating margin one being the tri-party method and one being the third-party method. Um, I think your case example is, is quite reflective of some of the larger groups we saw going through in the earlier phases in that there can be some very large central core entities where they will choose or it becomes obvious that you would go through tri-party as a means of allocating your margin. But then in your case study there are also fragmented smaller entities. Those fragmented smaller entities might only have five counterparties they might only have some US treasuries, very simple collateral, mm -hmm. nothing very much to optimize. And therefore it may be more advisable for that client to pick the third party op uh, option. Mm -hmm. But to my point, I will not advise them on which one to take, but it's, I provide them with the toolkit and then they will take the best direction. Um, it is evident, however, when you're at the smaller end, tri-party may not be appropriate because you have to remember that all of these margin allocations are done at the legal entity level. Despite the fact that Cadiz is one large group, each of those individual mm -hmm. uh, items is independently margining itself. And the very large one with the full asset class, access to cash and transformation, the more complex capability is ideally suited therefore to tri-party, whereas the more smaller end uh, users are almost undoubtedly better off going into the third party. So let's fast forward. Cadiz Group has appointed BNY Mellon as its sole custodian. We've put all the documents in place, all of the next gen and credit support deeds, the custody documentation. It's all there, it's all working. But of course, we've passed the compliance date and there's the day-to-day -day aspect of managing and transferring collateral. Could you talk me through a, a, almost a, a day in the life for Cadiz Group uh, and collateral transfers? Yes. So as we've said, uh, 
Let's assume that the Cadiz group has, has decided to use both the third party custodial segregation and the tri-party. Mm -hmm. So we'll address both of those. Now in the case of tri-party, the day-to-day, -day, um, given that it's largely a hands-off allocation process, will be that uh, I require a matched margin number. It's referred to as an RQV, required value. The Cadiz entity and its counterparty will submit that to me. Uh, I will receive that and upon matching of that number, so not disputed, it's a full number, mm -hmm. uh, I will then allocate appropriate collateral from Cadiz's uh, custody account, it's referred to in our language as a long box or a dealer box, and it will be allocated in favour of the counterparty, it will be pledged away. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, the secured party will receive reporting to show what they've received and the Cadiz entity will get a report that shows what's been allocated in, in their name. Uh, it, as I say, very hands-off, very automated, yep. and as long as that number keeps coming in every day, yep. and as long as there is enough collateral in the in the long box or oil in the engine, effectively, yep. then we will continue to collateralize, and the receiver will continue to receive. Now, I think you can see that that's a very hands-off, automated function. The tri-party agent is valuing the collateral on behalf of both parties. Mm -hmm. The tri-party agent is making automated decisions on which collateral to allocate based on predefined schedules. Now, if you've got the other end of the uh, optionality within Cadiz Group and someone is using a third-party custodial model, mm -hmm. slightly different, the day starts out similar mm -hmm. in that two parties will agree what their initial margin number is. They may dispute, but ultimately they come to a resolved pos mm -hmm. uh, position. Let's say that two parties have said the number is 10 and 10. Now, this is where it differs. Rather than going off to a tri-party agent to automate the process from here on, the third party is very similar to traditional variation margin. Mm -hmm. At this point, the Cadiz entity and its counterparty will agree a specific security, or potentially cash maybe, mm -hmm. that will be moved into an allocated account, yep. an encumbered account. Um, and this is a manual movement. So they will instruct us as custodian to move said asset into that allocated account and a report will be generated again at end of day that says this account now holds the following treasury. The obligation, however, is on the two parties to now monitor that security yeah. for eligibility and also to price it. Yeah. In the event that that security is no longer required, unlike in tri-party where the number would zero out and it would automatically unwind, then the secured party now has an obligation to instruct us as custodian to release all or partial of that asset. The very controlled method around how that can be performed. Now this is something that many in the sell side are familiar with. Mm -hmm. The third party model was long established with the hedge fund community. Yep. They've been posting IA this way for a number of years. Um, but I think that uh, it has historically been relatively manual in its process and that has some concerns amongst the dealer community. However, working with ISDA, we are looking to work to automate the release process and in the future we do expect many to be adopting SWIFT as a process mm -hmm. to enhance third party custody segregation. So for Cadiz Group they might, we might find that they're, they're choosing to post tri-party but they might be facing a pension fund who are using the third party That's service right. and that works. One side can be tri-party, the other side can be third party. And I think that's something just to pick up there whilst we've said it could be Bank of New York, Bank of New York through yeah. two methods. The, the, the other thing to understand is that Cadiz could be posting through BMY Mellon, mm -hmm. but now has to set up to receive through BMY Mellon, Euroclear, Clearstream, yeah. JP Morgan, possibly through X and Y and Z, other global custodian as well. So I think it mustn't be forgotten that the effort is not only on setting up your arrangement when you're posting, yep. but actually almost the bigger work is to receive across mm -hmm. the variety of methods that could come against you. Yeah. Mark, let's go back to the Cadiz group, and it's a broad group, and let's say they've got a range of collateral assets, mm. but not all of those collateral assets are eligible collateral for posting as initial margin. Mm -hmm. What options are available to the Cadiz group to transform those ineligible assets into eligible assets which are efficient to use? Okay, so um, as, we, you know, as we allude to, cash may be uh, problematic, mm -hmm. so they need to buy securities perhaps, um, which is not always desirable. They may need to reverse in securities, so enter the repo market. They may be able to engage with the larger parent. We see that quite often where the smaller entity is working with its parent organisation to source collateral, 
not on the open market, and ultimately have the right thing to, mm -hmm. to allocate. Um, other ways that we can see this happening, um, there is a change, or we're working towards a change for money market funds, a mm -hmm. cash-like instrument. We've also heard people talk about ETFs. Mm -hmm. Again, you, really, you're buying into an equity product, but it's going to become buy, reverse in, and then allocate out. Mark, thank you very much for those brilliant insights. I think it, they show just how complex this part of the IM puzzle is. So if you've made it this far, thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you for the next episode.